Today we're speaking with Dr. Ava Zabo, Chief of the Lung and Upper Air Digestive Cancer Research Group in the Division of Cancer Prevention at the National Cancer Institute. Dr. Zabo is the Chair of the Scientific Program Committee for Frontiers in Cancer Prevention Research. She is also Senior Editor of Cancer Prevention Research, a journal of the AACR. Thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Would you discuss what para peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma, known as PPAR gamma, is and how it is a target for aero digestive cancer prevention? It'd be my pleasure, uh, and it is a mouthful. Um, so PPAR gamma is actually the target of uh, some commonly used di anti-diabetic drugs. Uh, the, it's a class called thiazolidine dienes, and people know uh, some of these as pioglitazone is one of the drugs. Um, it's actually, um, to be uh, scientific about it, it's a nuclear receptor that's involved in signal transduction. Um, but what's important about it is that it's involved in differentiation and in growth cessation in cancers, a variety of cancers. And we and others have found that it's actually expressed in lung and head and neck cancers, um, and that uh, if you activate the receptor with specific drugs, that you can actually get cancers to stop growing in tissue culture, and we even have some data in people that you can shrink some lesions which are precursors to cancer. There's even some epidemiological data. So there's a whole body of evidence that suggests that this could be useful for cancer prevention. And there's even been a very small clinical trial that suggests this. Could you expand a little bit on that clinical trial and others maybe that are underway? So um, there was one small trial uh, performed by Dr. Frank Andre at the University of Minnesota under sponsorship by the Division of Cancer Prevention at NCI. And he actually looked at 22 people uh, who had these uh, lesions, which are known to be precursors to oral cancer. And actually, uh, with a short duration of treatment, three months, he was able to show that there was a, a very substantial shrinkage in a number of these lesions. So we actually have uh, two studies that are now, one of which is the direct follow-up to this. It's a 100-person study using uh, the drug pioglitazone, Actos. Uh, again, in people who have these uh, pre-malignant lesions, these precursors to oral cancer, um, it's, uh, the study is headed by Dr. Andre, again, and Dr. Jay Boyle at Memorial Sloan Kettering. 11 sites altogether, many places in the country, and the goal is to see, can we uh, make these cancer uh, precursors disappear? So that's the main study we have ongoing. Uh, there's a second pilot study, uh, which is now in the late stages of development. It'll be done at the Mayo Clinic. Um, uh, Dr. Dennis Weigel is the uh, uh, principal investigator. And in this study, we'll be looking at the effect of the same drug, pioglitazone, on uh, the lung epithelium, on the normal lung, on lung cancers in people who are going on to have cancer surgery for a documented or found lung cancer. Are there other new targets currently being investigated in air digestive cancer prevention clinical trials? There are. Uh, I think the uh, perhaps the most exciting one uh, that, um, uh, again, that the National Cancer Institute is sponsoring, by no means the only one, is a, a trial with a drug called myo-inositol. This is a uh, food constituent, actually. Uh, it comes from rice, uh, but many other food sources. Uh, it's purified. Uh, um, and um, again, there's a lot of, uh, there's preclinical data and there was a, a early phase clinical trial. This is done by Stephen Lamb uh, at, the, um, at British Columbia Cancer Agency that showed that we can reverse the pre-malignant lesions, the lesions that, uh, the areas of the lung that uh, are likely to go on to develop lung cancer. Um, so this is now a larger uh, study confirming these results. There are so many challenges with clinical trial enrollment. Do you find that the barriers to clinical trials is greater, about the same or less in cancer prevention research, and how can we overcome some of these challenges? <laughs> Loaded question. <laughs> um, uh, the barriers, I think, are to all clinical trials are huge, but to prevention trials are much greater. Uh, and I think one of the main reasons is because we don't want to focus on everybody. We really want to focus on the people who are the highest risk. And to identify those people is actually quite difficult. We do it uh, the way I showed, for instance, in identifying who's got a abnormality, which is known to be a precursor to lung cancer or to head and neck cancer or any other, but you have to screen people to find uh, the ones who actually harbor these abnormalities, and often the screening is uh, invasive. 
for the lung uh, studies, we actually have to do a bronchoscopy, go down and look in the lungs for uh, the head and neck cancers. We look at uh, the mouth, so you can see it easily, but then you have to biopsy. So these are all invasive tests, and uh, so there's expense. Uh, you have to uh, winnow down a large population to find the ones who are at risk. Um, so it's difficult, and that's just the beginning. <laughs> Well, what are your thoughts on how to identify and enact strategies for large at-risk populations that are largely asymptomatic? So our uh, options right now are not uh, great, uh, and it differs very much from uh, organ system to organ system. You know, again, in lung, we try to go right now with demographic information, uh, smokers, heavy smokers, uh, perhaps other demographic uh, uh, identifiers. Um, in breast cancer, we have the Gale model, which uh, allows us to identify higher risk uh, people. There's a lot of work being done looking at molecular markers, whether they be from blood, from sputum, from body fluids, um, that, uh, or for instance, uh, genetic markers, SNPs, uh, how we metabolize drugs, uh, how we metabolize carcinogens, that are helping us refine uh, who is at highest risk, but these models are in development. We have a long ways to go. And what are the risks that need to be considered? So the risk, again, uh, anything you do to any person comes with a risk as well as a benefit. There's no drug, frankly, no food that is completely safe. So in prevention in particular, because we're dealing with people who may develop a cancer but who don't have a cancer now and may never develop a cancer, even if they're high risk, you really need interventions that are going to be extremely safe, well-tolerated. Um, and and that, that's a pretty high bar, because people may need to take these for a long time. Again, uh, a lot of work has to uh, come together to make this a reality. Dr. Zavo, thank you so much. Thank you.